uh, to start. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third, yeah, it is the third lecture in, um, in our um, November uh, mini school. And, um, and, and today they, they, they we have a switch in, in lecturer and uh, Dr. Yapi Gri from no Northwest University will, uh, will speak about the uh, applications of, uh, of artificial intelligence. And as, as you can see on this first slide, it will be about literature review. So it promises to be a, a very, very, very useful uh, lesson. So Yapi, uh, thank you very much for uh, being part of the lecturing team of this uh, very exciting mini school. And uh, please, you are most and welcome to start with, with your presentation. And sorry, I always forget, please make use of the Q&A facility at the bottom of your Zoom screen uh, to ask questions. And maybe towards the end, if you want to raise your hand virtually, we will give you the right to, to ask a question in person. Yeah. So yeah, please, over to you. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, welcome to this lecture. As you can see, it's on artificial intelligence assisted literature review. I'm Dr. Yapi Khrir from the Northwest University. Um, so what I'm going to do, if my keyboard will work, there, um, I'm just going to give a little bit of an introduction to who we are. It's obviously gonna be a, just a quick overview because Martin will have already presented a, a little bit on this in his two lectures. Uh, but after that, I'll give a little bit of background uh, as to what, uh, what it is I'm gonna be presenting on. We're going to look specifically at systematic literature reviews, how the process normally works, and then an example of a literature review that was done. And then I'm going to show you the artificial intelligence side of things and how we can use tools to make this go a little bit faster. Um, so uh, from our group, uh, the two main uh, project investigators are uh, Prof. Martin Bucher and myself, Dr. Yopi Kriev. Martin is from a whole bunch of different universities, so he's predominantly based in Paris. Uh, but has been a friend of NITEX for a very long time. Uh, I am based at the Northwest University and uh, obviously also a NITEX associate. So uh, just uh, as a note, uh, Malala, who's also a member of our team, will just be presenting a little bit of practical demonstrations uh, at the end of my lesson that just feeds on to the work that her and Martin presented last week. So please stick around for that. Okay, so now by way of introduction, what are we talking about? Uh, the first thing we're gonna look at is what is a literature review and why we do literature reviews. Now, as you should all know, as you are either postgraduate students or have been postgraduate students in the past that are now researchers, uh, a literature review is one of the most important first steps in a study. It allows you to ground yourself in the literature to see what other people have done and to identify gaps to see where your literature or your you know, input into the literature can contribute to human knowledge. Now, depending on what field you come from, this can either be done in a fairly ad hoc way or you can approach it a lot more systematically. Now, in science, and even to a certain extent in things like engineering, we tend to do things in a fairly ad hoc way. So we, built on, we build on techniques that we find in the literature, um, and we look at case studies, but we don't necessarily go through a process of trying to find everything that relates to a specific topic. And that is going to be more the kind of thing we talk about today. Now, when we say literature review, there are a number of different ways in which you can approach literature review. The traditional form is what we would call a narrative literature review, where you take in a bunch of papers that contribute to the knowledge that you want to, to contribute towards and give you uh, or give the reader a sort of context to you know, what the research is that you're going to be presenting to them. The second way we can do it is through a systematic literature review, where you follow a more scientific approach to setting up and structuring your, your literature review so that it is something that is also repeatable in, in future. You get a scoping review where you're just trying to understand uh, you know, the scope of the problem that you're trying to, under, uh, to understand in your research. So it's not necessarily a systematic literature review. It's more of a, you know, finding your feet in where you are right now, in which directions you want to be taking in your research. You also get integrative literature reviews, which are almost like multiple systematic literature reviews, where you would take a systematic literature review of maybe three different fields and then synthesize them together into one cohesive narrative that, uh, that you can use to understand you know, the phenomena that you're studying. Uh, you can even do a bibliometric uh, literature review, 
which is less to do with the content of the research papers you're looking at, but more allowing you to understand which researchers are the most cited, which universities are, you know, centers of excellence for the kind of research you want to be doing. So it allows you to study who's doing the research rather than what the research is specifically. Now, for us today, we're going to be looking specifically at systematic literature reviews. Okay. So what is a systematic literature review? It is basically a systematic approach to identifying relevant sources and content to add into your literature review. It is gaining traction in a number of different fields, but the main application has generally been in medical research. So that is where you say, I want to understand what the treatment options are for malaria in you know, XYZ context. And then you try and get a full understanding of all of the literature that exists that contributes to that question. So at the end of that systematic literature review, someone should be able to read your work and get a fully up-to-date knowledge of everything that is happening within the scope that you set for the literature review. Um, I'm going to pull here from a quote from Fink, which says that a systematic literature review is a, system a systematic, explicit, and reprodu reproducible method for identifying, evaluating, and synthesizing the existing body of completed and recorded works produced by researchers, scholars, and practitioners. Uh, it's always good to have a, a, a definition thrown in there. Now, when we say it is systematic, uh, what do we mean? Now, PRISMA is the, is the international organization that basically uh, you know, puts forward the guidelines for how to do a systematic literature review. Obviously, uh, a lot of it is going to be re referenced to uh, medical literature, but they've actually published a, a checklist of the things that need to be in place for something to be a systematic literature review. So as long as you can check all the boxes, um, you know that you've covered all of the things that you need to cover for this uh, thing to be systematic, reproducible, et cetera. And what's interesting to note about a systematic literature review is that it becomes a research output in its own right. Um, so where you would, with a normal study, do your, system, your normal literature review, and that becomes a part of a paper that just gives people context to your actual work, a systematic literature review is a first step that you take that you then publish to say, this is the, the state of knowledge as it exists now, and this is what I'm building on in a second paper. So the checklist is obviously the one side of it. Um, this is all contained in what's called the PRISMA statement, which is a very heavily um, cited uh, document. But in addition to the checklist, there are a number of flowcharts and techniques that they show you um, to, to guide you through the process of doing a systematic literature review. So this is the one for a new systematic literature review. You can also do updated systematic literature reviews. But basically what you're going to do is you're going to identify records from the databases, okay? So that'll be things like Scopus, Web of Science, MedNet, or whatever the case may be. Um, and then you're going to be very explicit about the search terms that you used, what sort of date range you were looking at, if there were any filters you put in place, everything that is needed for someone else to use the exact same search terms and search strategy to get to the exact same records that you got to from the databases. What's also interesting to note from a systematic literature review is that it generally also allows you to add what's called gray literature. So that would be things like websites, blogs, even emails or interviews with experts or you know, uh, conversations you had with experts in the field all of that can also be added to a systematic literature review to give you as much information as is possible to start from, okay? So that's the initial phase, which is what we call the identification. The next phase is going to be the screening of the records, okay? So you take in all of this information that you, uh, that you collected from the databases, and then you screen them to see which of them are relevant and not relevant for your specific study. Because you're searching on keywords, you will find lots of records. Uh, and you'll see in examples you know, how many records we are talking about. The screening process is going to be looking at the titles and the abstracts of these papers. So not yet looking at the full papers, just looking at the abstracts to see whether the work should be included or excluded from the study. 
And once you've included enough of the uh, of the abstracts and full uh, full title documents, you will then retrieve those papers in their full paper form um, to see you know which ones you can actually assess for eligibility into to include them into the systematic literature review. So the screening gets rid of a lot of papers that are not re relevant. And it's only when you go through the, uh, the retrieve papers that you're doing effectively the same thing as a narrative literature review. The gray literature uh, goes through the exact same process. You see which ones you will pull full text for, and then you will be very explicit as to showing uh, and showing what you, approaches you took to exclude records. Um, so not everything that you find from a general Google search is going to be relevant, but you just need to say why things have been excluded when you finally do the literature, be, uh, uh, literature review itself. Okay. So by way of example, what do I mean by searching a database? Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail here because most of you should be familiar with this through your own libraries. But basically, this is Scopus, uh, which is one of the biggest databases that we would use in uh, science. Uh, and obviously, things like Web of Science uh, are, are also very relevant. But basically, what you want to do is you want to search within the article uh, uh, title, the abstracts, and the keywords that have been added. And then you want to give it a number of search terms. Okay, And those search terms are going to include everything that you want to have inside of your systematic literature review. Or if you want to do it not as a systematic literature review, which is what I'm encouraging you to do, um, the search terms that are relevant to your study. Okay, And this is going to pop up you know, a long list of documents that you can get, uh, you know, you can look at individually, you can look at the full text, but what you actually want to do for this process is you want to just export the citation information. So who the authors are, you know, when it was published, uh, you know, which journal it's in, all sorts of stuff like that, as well as the abstract and keywords. So you're going to have, you know, the authors, the title, the abstract and the keywords in a database. Okay, there are a number of formats that you can export this into. Uh, one of the best ones to use, especially for the process we'll show today, would be RIS. Um, but you can also generally export into CSV or Excel format or even plain text, um, depending on the tools that you're using for your uh, citation management. Um, at the Northwest University, we've got access to EndNote. So obviously we use EndNote for all of our citation management, but there are a number of different options. Okay, so that is just an example of how you would search through a database, um, which I think everyone should be fairly comfortable at this point. Okay, so once you've gone through that, this is the general process that you will follow for doing the systematic literature review. Okay, you're going to search and find all the records. So for that, you're going to hit your databases, and they're going to come back with a lot of data that you can export and put into your reference management software. So being EndNote being one of them. The next step you're going to do is as much deduplication as is possible in your tool. So EndNote, for example, will look at whether, uh, you know, two records have the same author, journal, uh, abstract information, same year, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and use a number of these metrics to identify when two records from two different databases are actually referring to the same paper. Um, not all tools have that feature but you want to deduplicate as much as you possibly can, okay? The next step that you're gonna go through is then screening the records, okay? So how this works is you're gonna select from this list of, uh, of records you've now gained from you know, your databases, you select a random record. This can be you know, the first one that's, that's in the list, or you can just pick them at random. And then you will look at the title and abstract and see whether this actually belongs inside of the systematic literature review. So is it relevant in terms of what you're looking at, your research question, you know, is this the kind of literature that you want to read later on to make sense of, okay? So you're gonna select the random record, you're gonna label it as either applicable or not applicable. And once you've gone through all of the records, um, you will finally stop and export this again, okay? Once you've exported it, you can use, again, the databases to access the full text versions of the papers that you have now labeled as being applicable. Um, and this you're going to read like a normal literature review. Okay, so you've now identified things that you think are relevant. You're going to read a little bit deeper into them and, you know, 
Based on that, you're going to se select your final set of records, and that's going to go into the document that you actually write to tell people the narrative of your literature review. So as an example, um, this is a study done on, the PT on PTSD of burn victims that was published in 2017, uh, and they also made the data set available freely so that you can see which records have been you know, labeled as applicable and not applicable based on the research question that they put forward in the study. So what you'll see is that from database searching, they found 11,395 records, okay? Now, what's always important to remember when you're doing a literature study is that you can be very specific, in which case you're going to get less records, but you run the risk of missing um, appropriate papers that didn't meet your very stringent search requirements. Or you can be a little bit more open-ended and throw more general keywords into the mix, but then you're gonna end up in a situation where you're capturing the majority or all of the, uh, the records that are relevant to your study, but you capture so much you know, more that you now need to screen through in order to get to the relevant stuff. So in this example, they had 11,395 records coming from multiple databases, as well as 1,521 gray literature sources, okay? They then put it through duplication removal, which then ended up with 6,185 records. Of those 6,185 records, they screened them against the research questions, and they excluded 5,822 records, okay? which means that 363 records were assessed as being eligible for the systematic literature review, at which point they were read as full papers and 329 of them were then found to be not entirely applicable. And the full study synthesis then ended up with 34 records. So of the initial 11,395, it was found that only 34 spoke directly to the research question that was being studied in the systematic literature review. And that then gives a very up-to-date study of what is the state of play with exactly the question you are answering in that systematic literature review. It also shows then what the gaps are because you've now looked a little bit wider than these 34 papers, and you have found nothing that, um, that doesn't speak to the gap that you're looking for, okay? But now, as you can imagine, this process of screening is a very long and time-consuming process, especially because for a systematic literature review, one of the check marks that they have in that list is that you preferably should have more than one researcher actually going through the data set. So, the idea is if you've got two people that are screening the records, they will be much less likely to miss records due to things like human fatigue. Because I mean, if you're going through 6,000 records, it's very easy to become fatigued and to, you know, by accident mark something as irrelevant when it actually should have been relevant in your study. So it gives you just a catch net uh, in case you miss something, but it also gives you some triangulation to say, okay, if two people have found that these re records are relevant, then they're definitely relevant to the study, okay? So the golden, you know, the golden sample or the golden, you know, approach to systematic literature reviews is to have more than one person going through the same data set, okay? So it is an intense and time-consuming project to undertake, okay? but there are tools that we can use to make this process fa uh, faster, okay? So one of the things that we could do, for example, is if we've got these two people that are reviewing the same data set, one of them, for example, can go the traditional route, another one can use an AI-assisted route, for example, um, to just make sure that the same data is captured by two people, but the one screening process is gonna be a lot faster. Or you can go through the process with multiple models with one researcher, um, to just make sure that you capture the same records if you try and approach the data set from two different points of view, okay? Um, we can get into a long discussion as to these sorts of strategies, but for now, what I want to do is to take you through a technology-based approach to making this process a little bit more manageable. And the project that we're going to look at is AS Review, okay? Um, the little character that you've got there is called Elas, who is short for electronic assistant, and he kind of represents AS Review. So what does the software do? 
Okay. Basically, it uses active learning, which is a kind of semi-supervised learning, to study the sorts of articles that you are accepting or labeling as relevant in your screening process and to then present you with articles that it thinks are relevant as well. Okay. So where you were traditionally going through things randomly, just one by one, here, AS Review is going to try and predict for you which of the papers you actually want to see based on what it's learned from what you've labeled to thus far. So what we're trying to do here is go through the same number of records in terms of screening, but instead of having to screen everything yourself, the machine does some of the screening for you. Um, and then just uses you as an oracle to make sure that it is doing the right thing, okay? But the end result of the systematic literature review should be exactly the same. So how does this work? Now, next week, we will dive a little bit more deeply into active learning from a Python, you know, technical perspective. But just from a high level, the active learning cycle basically starts off with a model that is given a small set of um, relevant and irrelevant records, okay? So if you're giving it five relevant and five irrelevant records, uh, you create a small machine learning model from that, okay? And that model then looks at the pool of unlabeled records and presents you with a new record, okay? And it's what's called a human in the loop training model, okay? So it presents you with a new uh, record and you label it as either relevant or irrelevant. And every time you make a decision, it updates its own model, okay? So after a while, it should start giving you more and more and more relevant information from this pool of unlabeled records, okay? But with this, um, the human is the oracle. So this active model, uh, active learning model is created iteratively with each record that is labeled, but even though it starts out inaccurate, the more kind of information that you give it to make the, the model more accurate, the better it becomes, okay? Now, when we say machine learning model, there are a number of different models that can be used. Uh, the basic one that is sort of the, at, if you're trying it the first time, kind of the recommended model would be to use um, term frequency, inverse document frequency, feature extraction along with a naive Bayes classifier, but there are, you know, any number of feature extraction models that you can use um, along with word embeddings and, you know, all sorts of clever things. And uh, the classifiers can either be basic things like support vector machines or logistic regression, or they can be much more, com uh, you know, complex with, uh, I think the newest version uh, that's maybe a little bit newer than this table uh, includes things like BERT. Um, as one of the big convolutional neural networks that you can use to, um, yeah, uh, actually, no, I lie. it's not a convolutional net neural network, it's a transformer-based network. Um, but, but yes, the idea is that you can use a variety of these different methods that you kind of connect together to do these recommendations for you. Okay, we will go into the technical side of it, as I say, next week in a little bit more detail. This time, I just want to show you what is possible with the tool to hopefully get you a little bit excited. Okay, so what sort of results can you actually expect? So here is an example of uh, one of the, the studies that they use as a, as a benchmark. And the study is entitled Psychological Theories of Depressive Relapse and Recurrence, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of Prospective st uh, Studies. So in this study, um, they actually did it in two phases. So initially, they, they um, found 38,780 records. Um, I think it was in 2060, um, which led to 58 eligible articles through the systematic literature review. But they then did an updated uh, search in November of 2018, which yielded 4,806 original records, which added eight additional records to the full set of data. Okay. And the way you plot the effectiveness of using this sort of system or an automated system compared to a normal literature review is you graph it, okay? So what you will see on this graph is that there's a gray line that is running sort of in steps from zero all the way to the end. And that is basically the random line. So that is saying that if you were to look at 
these articles, just randomly picking them out of the pile. You would assume a, a fairly normal distribution uh, over these articles. So as you go through the full list, you will basically increment this in a roughly linear way. Okay, It may be a little bit off, but that is basically your simulated random line, where the assumption is made that if you've gone through all of the records, you will have found all of the relevant articles. The blue line is the recall curve. So that is now saying that they used the software okay, to identify records more effectively. And they found that by screening only 5% of the total number of records, they'd already found 95% of the relevant records from the data set. Okay? Um, and we'll see in a minute uh, why that makes it a little bit complex. But, uh, but this is the kind of results that you can expect from these sorts of systems. And in particular, this is uh, what is achieved with AS review in the specific study. Now, that is basically when they started the project and, and really kind of running through what they can do. But what's also important to note is that different combinations of models will give different results. So some are more effective than others, okay? So here is just um, an example of a simulation that you can do using data um, or a fully labeled data set. And effectively here, you will see on the right-hand side, each of these curves is a combination of a classifier and a feature extraction uh, strategy. So for example, looking at the orange line, that is linear regression classifier with a term frequency inverse document frequency um, feature extraction. And it finds on the bottom that you would need to only screen about 4% um, percent of, uh, of records, or yeah, it's about 4% of the records, in order to get to 95% of, uh, of the records being found. Uh, so that's on the vertical axis on the, with the little dotted lines. Uh, but then something like a random forest with a, a term frequency in the inverse document frequency, in that instance, you had to have gone to about 11% before you would have found 95% of the articles. Okay? The second uh, dotted lines are on the uh, y-axis, and that's basically at the 10% mark. So having screened 10% of the articles, how many articles will you have found that are relevant? Okay? And again, you can see that the linear regression with, uh, with TF-IDF uh, works incredibly effective. Um, so this is how you can do your own simulation study. And I will show you in a moment how you can do that. But uh, in order to kind of validate the tool and make sure it is something that we can use with the PRISMA guidelines to give us you know, proper systematic literature reviews, this is by the... Um, the public, oh, the, the developers of the system, and it was actually published in Nature, where they took four very large um, data sets of uh, published uh, systematic literature reviews and worked through exactly the same process that we talked about now. And they put forward two different methods um, to identify whether you're winning or not. And that is the R RRF at 10%. So that is basically looking at the number of relevant references you found after screening 10%. Okay. And you will see there for the four studies, um, this varies between studies, but it was, you know, 70% in the first one, a 99.03 in the second one, 100% in the third one, and 83% in the fourth one, okay? So 10%, you know, in some instances, we'll find everything. In some instances, we'll find 70%. Um, it depends on the, on the content of the study. And the next metric was basically uh, WSS at 95%, which, which is the work you would have saved over having doing this manually um, to find 95% of the relevant articles. Okay, So um, in the top uh, uh, example, or the first example, we had WSS 95 at 67%, which means you've saved 67% of the time you would have spent you know, sam uh, sampling this randomly. Um, or there's also WSS at 100%, which means that you found all of the records at that point, um, and the rest of the time is effectively, you know, would have been wasted, okay? So in the first study, that is 41%. So you would have saved 41% of the time having found all of the articles. Now, the re reason there is the split between 95% and 100% is 
is that not everyone requires a systematic literature review to cover literally 100% of all possible you know, articles. So if you're doing it in medicine, it's a good idea to go to 100%. But if you're doing it in something like computer science, it's not necessarily relevant for you to say, okay, I have found every paper that is conceivably relevant to this field you know, with 100% certainty. It's good if you do, but you know, there is that margin for, for error there. Now, having said all that, okay, are there risks? Okay, so here is an example of what can happen. Um, and again, it speaks to this question of whether you need to have 100% of the articles found or, you know, whether 95% is enough, okay? So what you will see on the left-hand side, okay? So these are basically looking at the same uh, data set, um, uh, but, but basically having on the right-hand side something mislabeled. Um, so if you accidentally mislabel something as irrelevant, the model will still update and it will maybe exclude something that would be similar to the thing that you've now accidentally excluded. So that's the one problem on the right-hand side. The other problem on the left-hand side relates to what we call the stopping point, because in the simulations I've shown you, that is making the assumption that you have a fully labeled data set, okay? But if you're doing a new literature review, that is not necessarily the case. So you don't necessarily know how many records there are that are relevant, okay? So one of the ways in which you save time is by saying that you've searched through X percentage of the data set, and you're going to assume that, let's say at 40%, I will have found all the records, okay? Or alternatively, which is maybe a better stopping rule, is to say that if I find in my search that 100 records in a row are all irrelevant, then I make the assumption that the model has now presented me with all of the relevant you know, papers, okay? Um, but now the problem is, if you look at that first uh, figure, okay, it went very quickly up to about you know, 20% of the papers being reviewed. And then there was 15% of the records where it stayed at exactly the same level. And only at about 50% did they find one additional record. Okay? So if you stopped around the 20% mark, you would have found 95% of the records. But that uh, with the assumption that you've gone, you know, let's say 50 records in and found nothing relevant. But there is that risk that you miss one paper or two papers um, just because of the nature of the model, okay? So it depends on your specific study as to whether you need to have everything that is relevant or whether it's okay to make the assumption that you know, if I searched 100 records and they were all irrelevant, that I found enough of the literature. From a systematic literature point of view, in the PRISMA guidelines, you just need to be explicit, okay? So whatever stopping strategy you use needs to be stated exactly so that other people can basically reproduce the search and see whether they find the same thing. Okay, so that's basically the, uh, the what you can expect from the software, but now, we need to just see how to use it. Um, so I'm going to go through this in slides because just in case uh, you know my, my demo doesn't work as well as I wanted to. Uh, but basically, uh, there are two main places you can get this. AS Review is completely free. It is completely open source. And they have a very active community. And the, the developers are very keen for people to obviously add features and you know expand the system as much as is possible. Um, but you can also just use it as a user by going to asreview.nl. And the installation process is super simple. You need Python, um, so you know the latest version of Python. And then you do pip install asreview. And then from your, uh, your console, asreview.lab, and that starts it up. Um, it's a browser-based application that runs locally on your machine. So everything is self-contained on your machine. And I'll show you in a minute how you can also export all of the, the models and the data that you generate. So um, in terms of what it looks like, it's got a very you know, nice, sleek Django uh, interface. 
um, which basically allows you to have multiple projects running at the same time. So you could do more than one simulation at a time. Everything is stored separately. You can bring it up and, and drop it off you know, very, very easily. And then on the bottom right, there is create. So you just create a systematic literature review you know, by clicking through a number of features, okay? So the first thing when you, uh, when you create a systematic literature review, there are three different ways in which you can use the software. The way you will mostly use it for your own study will be in the Oracle mode. So that allows you to take a data set that you import as a RIS file or even as a CSV or text file. Um, you import your own data set and you then go through the process of labeling things as relevant or irrelevant, as you'll see in a minute. You can also do exploration mode, which is basically allowing you to just try out the software. Um, and for that, you can use one of their known data sets that are basically included in the software to just show you, you know, how the process would, process would work for your own data set um, and just, just can't get comfortable with, uh, with the features of the software. And finally, there is simulation mode where you take a fully labeled data set, so one of the ones that they make available, and you then test the performance of different model combinations against that labeled data set. So you basically say that I am using this model. If I was to go through the process of labeling it myself, but now obviously this one is labeled, how would this model perform? So which, mod uh, which records would it recommend to me? And how can I compare that against the random line? Okay. So uh, all of these, again, you know, fully, fully play, uh, customizable, uh, but it is a good way to just sort of get comfortable with the software by using exploration before jumping in and doing your own uh, uh, data set. So um, again, just from a training perspective, start with exploration. And then in the software, there are the four papers that were published in that Nature article. Um, those four data sets are available to you as fully labeled data sets. So the best one to start with is that PTSD trajectories, which is that very first example that I showed you guys. And it has 37 relevant records in the, in the data set of uh, what you will see is 5,782 records. Um, it also recognizes that there are 61 duplicates in this data set, okay? So you will have either picked the data set uh, if you're ex exploring things, or you will have imported the data set um, to get to this point. Okay, now the next step, once you've got the data set inside the software, you'll see there's a, a second line there that says add prior knowledge. So this is where we're basically going to build the basis for our models. Okay, if you've got a fully labeled data set, it's very easy to, to then just find five, five uh, relevant records um, and five irrelevant records. But basically, you want to give the model something to work from. So you will have hopefully one or two golden papers, uh, which are kind of the ones that start off your literature review that you can add here and say to the model, OK, these are the kinds of things that I'm looking for. And then you just do a random search for any two other papers at which you can then label for the model to say, these are not the kind of thing I'm looking for. The more data you add in this first step, the better the model is going to be, but it only needs one relevant and one irrelevant paper to start the model. It's just that it's then going to not be a particularly you know, effective model from the beginning, okay? So the more data you add, the better it's going to be. Garbage in, garbage out, okay? Um, but again, if it is a, a benchmark data set, it would already have been labeled. So it's a very easy process to go through. So once you've selected the relevant and irrelevant data sets, it's now up to you to choose the model that you actually want to use. Based on the, the simulations that they've done and the papers that have been published, um, TFIDF and Naive Bay seems to be a, a really good baseline to start with. Uh, unless you have very specific needs uh, in terms of the language or, you know, that if you've got terms that mean the same thing, but there are, you know, tons and tons and tons of different synonyms um, for those terms, it can be difficult for, you know, naive base to do that. And then something that uses word embeddings may be better. But for the most part, um, those defaults seem to work very, very well. Um, another thing to note is just the querying strategy. Um, we will see next week again from a technical perspective what that means, but there are different ways for the model to present you with, uh, with records. 
Um, so some of them, you would say, you know, give me the record that if chosen as relevant would create the most change in the model. That's one strategy to go towards. Another strategy is to say, give me the, the record that you as model are the least certain about. So, so if it is the most uncertainty in terms of whether it's relevant or irrelevant, give me that. Because again, that's hopefully going to lead to you know, a much better understanding in the model of what the data set is, is comprised of. But again, uh, in terms of the different strategies and classifiers, we will talk about that a bit more next week. Um, so once you've selected your model, um, it just built it. So again, it is fully built and kept on your computer. So you can relook at a model again later, or you can publish it to GitHub so that other people can see what your model is like. But once it's built, this is the screen that you'll be that you'll find. Okay? It's basically going to present you with the title and the abstract. And all you need to do on the bottom is to pick irrelevant or relevant. That's the only decision you have to make in this process. Now, obviously, in this, you know, in this process, you need to have your research question right at hand, but you as researcher will know exactly what you are looking for and what is irrelevant. So in my case, for example, where my study is, is looking very much at bipolar disorder, um, if I search through the databases for bipolar, I find tons and tons of articles on bipolar disorder as the psychiatric disorder, as well as bipolar transistors because that is also you know, a whole field in and of itself. So I have lots of records that are irrelevant that come from engineering, but I can select those that are relevant just based on this choice of relevant or irrelevant, okay? As you're going through this process of marking these things, there is an analytics tab, which is just going to keep track for you of the number of records that it finds at you know, the different time spans on the progress bar on the bottom as well as showing you how many records have been labeled from the full data set and how many of them are relevant. It also keeps track of the irrelevant records since your last relevant. So that is where you've got that stopping rule that, that is in place. So here you can say, okay, if I've got 5,700 records and I've got maybe 100 that have been irrelevant in a row, then I'm fairly certain that I have found all of the records as an example. A little bit lower down on the analytics, it's also got the recall graph, um, which just basically tracks in blue the um, what it would have been with relevant uh, with random sampling, and in yellow um, the number of records that you have found already. So in this case, um, I have reviewed thirty six records. Um, I would not have found a single one if I was doing it, you know, randomly. But at this point, I have already found eight of the 37 records that I know from the, the data that has been fully labeled, okay? So as I said, in this one, there are 37 relevant articles, but if you have a new data set, you won't necessarily know when to stop exactly um, in terms of how many relevant records they are, but you know, n number of irrelevant articles or percentage of data set are both ways in which you can do this. So at this point, I have found 32 relevant articles and I've screened 160 of the records. Um, if I was doing this randomly, I would have found at this point one um, record, okay? Now, uh, you obviously pay attention to, you know, the number of records that, it, that you screened and the number of irrelevant records. And once you've got to the point where you feel that you've gotten enough out of the data set, um, it's as easy as clicking export to export either the data set or the model. Um, and both of those can just be done from, from the export screen. Now, it's just important to note that if you imported your data sets as RIS, then RIS will be one of the options you have to export. But if you export uh, imported it as CSV, it doesn't generate RIS, RIS files for you. Um, so just when you, uh, RIS gives you the most options when you import it into something like EndNote, just try and keep to, to, that, um, to that format. Okay, so in terms of conclusions, um, if you use AI to search through the literature, it makes it a lot easier. Um, it, it allows you to make cast a really wide net in the databases to find as many articles as you possibly can, and then to zero in on those using uh, AI to, to guide you 
uh, as to which articles are the most relevant for your study. It's also really useful from a scientific perspective and an open science perspective to have a reproducible data set. Because you push these things into risk files, it's very easy to put that onto your GitHub along with the model to show that this is exactly the process you went through to do your systematic literature review or even just the normal literature review guided by AI. Um, and it makes it a lot easier for an examiner, for example, for a PhD, to say, yes, this person has actually gone through enough of the literature to make the claims that they're making in their study. So next week, we will look a little bit deeper at active learning itself and how you can use it to teach models faster than what you would normally do with, uh, with supervised learning. But uh, yes, I think for now, that is me. I've got a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to stop sharing my slides and just show you actually what it looks like. Uh, so let's see if it will allow me to share this. Okay, hopefully you can all see my AS review. And uh, as I said, it is literally as easy as this is basically running, as you can see on localhost. So I've just got it running straight from Python. The GUI pops up you know, automatically and is very, very easy to work through. Uh, if I want to create a new review, I just click create. I'm going to do it as an exploration, for example. I'm going to close this silly thing. Um, and this will just be test of features. I am the author. I go next. At this point, I'm going to add a data set. Because I'm going through exploration, it gives me the option of looking at any one of these data sets that have been made available. You can also import data sets. Um, there is a very active community on um, AS Review that, uh, that looks at all the places where you can find data sets that have been published, um, or you can get from authors that have also used the software and published it on their GitHub. But for now, let's look at the PTSD trajectories. It's going to take a moment to just upload it because it is obviously fairly big with thousands and thousands of records. Okay, so it's loaded. I add my prior knowledge. So I'm going to, uh, no, I don't want to search. I want to go random. So here I'm just saying, give me five random relevant records because it is already you know labeled, I can do this. Otherwise, I would have just used search to pick that golden paper that you know is relevant to your study. Just search for the title, it'll pop up here. Uh, so if I say PTSD, for example, um, then it's gonna give me from the data set all of the, the papers that are, are, are gonna meet with that search criteria. So just use the name of that paper. But because this is fully labeled, I'm gonna pick random. I'm gonna look for relevant records. So I'm saying this is relevant, this is relevant, this is relevant, this is relevant, and this one is relevant. I now want irrelevant records. So I say, this one is not relevant, not relevant, not relevant, not relevant, and not relevant. So now I've got five relevant and five irrelevant records. So I can close. My next step is to choose my model. Again, there are lots and lots of options that you can pick for feature extraction or um, classifier or even the querying strategy. But for now, let us leave it on the defaults. It's now going to build up our model for us. So this can take maybe 30 seconds just, uh, just with the model that I've got. Well, hopefully just 30 seconds. OK, 
okay, the model has been built. I can then start reviewing. And this is the screen that it shows me. So this first label that I've got, or this first record that I've got here, um, I got the title, I've got the, the abstract, and because it's in a fully labeled data set, it's irrelevant, so I can mark it as irrelevant. This one is also irrelevant, but this one is now relevant. So if I start looking at my analytics, I will see that I have gone through 13 records. The first 10 were the ones that I marked as relevant and irrelevant. I found the first five relevant articles as prior knowledge, and I've now found one from the data sets already. There are zero irrelevant records since the last relevant one, obviously, because I just marked it as, as relevant. And my recall at this point in time looks excellent because I've only screened three records and I've already found six uh, that are relevant. Um, this recall graph is obviously only looking at the ones that you search through without including the prior knowledge. So I've only got one here in the recall graph and I've only screened three. Um, if I do something wrong, I've got a history as well that I can look at, which just shows me the relevant and irrelevant things that I have marked already. So if you think that you've done something incorrectly and you, you can go through your relevant studies to just check whether you know, you've added one incorrectly, but you can also you know, search through them. So if there is a paper that you think should have been in here and isn't, you can search through your irrelevant records and mark it as converting it to irrelevant or irrelevant by just clicking the little heart. Then the export, you can either export the project, which gives you the data and the model configuration, which people can then just pull into AS Review and see what you've done, or the data set itself. And if you're doing the data set, this one wasn't included as risk, so risk isn't an option, but it is CSV, and then you can just click export, and it will save it in your wherever you want to. So I'm putting it in temp and there it's available for other people to look at. Okay, and that is pretty much my story. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah, Think. Uh, sorry. Thank you very much, Yapi. That was really interesting and uh, I guess super useful for, for, for most of us. <laughs> uh, I know that you announced that uh, um, Malala will give a, a little uh, Jupyter notebook demonstration just now, but before we ask her to, um, to do that, um, maybe it's the appropriate time to ask participants if they have any questions. Um, mm -hmm. ah, I see, sorry, there is a question uh, in the Q&A that you might have already answered, and it is uh, by an anonymous attendee, how will we perform deduplication? Maybe you want uh, to comment briefly again. Yes, uh, so, so the easiest is to use your um, citation manager. So in my case, it's going to be EndNote, um, but uh, you know, uh, any one of the, of, the, of the citation managers has some features for doing deduplication. EndNote is very good at it, admittedly. Um, RefWorks, I think, also has a pretty good uh, feature for it, but uh, you can also do it manually. Um, they are actually... Um, uh, scripts available on the AS Review website if you're using something like Excel to, to track your, your citations. Um, they can actually do Python scripts to do the, the deduplication there, but the easiest is definitely through your, your citation manager. Thank you very much for that. Then there is another question in the, in the Q&A uh, by Ditiro. And he is an R user. And he asks whether one can use R to do that as well. Absolutely. Um, so there are some scripts for R that are also available, but um, I didn't add it into the presentation because I've only got so much time. But at the same time as running the front end, it's also got an API that you can use to extract and do any interactions that you want to with AS Review from a script as well. So you can do that through Python or you can do it with R. It is a standard uh, API that you would call. Um, to, to use it. So yes, you can absolutely use it with R. Thank but you can much. also use it, uh, it the, the, the program itself runs from Python. So that is why you install it with Python and run it from Python. But you don't need to do any scripts to actually make it work. Um, it works all by itself. You can do everything from the front end. Thank you. Thank you, Yapi. Thank you very much for that. 
Uh, now we have two questions by uh, uh, Rory Sang. Uh, the first question is, I think, more general, and it's about is active learning similar to reinforcement learning? So no. Um, so reinforcement learning, you would have a model that is interacting with an environment and giving you feedback based on the decisions of that model. Um, so you kind of grow your, your model against an environment. This is basically a kind of supervised learning and specifically semi-supervised learning, where with normally with supervised learning, you would have all of your information labeled um, and then you try and build a model from this fully labeled data set. With this, you have some of your data set labeled and you use that to build an initial model and then you actively take record for record the teaching process forward. The idea is uh, with supervised learning, you have to go through your full data set to get a good model. Um, the idea with active learning or semi-supervised learning is that you can get a good model much earlier by picking the correct uh, querying strategy. But I will go through that in much more detail in next week's uh, next week's presentation. Okay, very good. Thank you. And uh, from Rory Zhang, there is another question, uh, a little bit more specific. Uh, when starting up in the manual classification of relevant and irrelevant material, is it advisable to make sure the classes are balanced, or will the AI sort it out for me if my selection is imbalanced? For example, five, rele five relevant and three irrelevant. So, uh, so five is is a good thumb suck number um, to work with, but it can literally work from one relevant and one irrelevant already. So you can add more. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be balanced. And for the most part, um, and again, we will see that uh, in in next week's the, uh, presentation. But when you're doing a systematic review, the bulk of the records you're going to find are going to be irrelevant. Um, so you want to search through the, the, the relevance uh, models much, much, much faster. But there is a, an inherent bias in the data set for irrelevant module, models. And that is what makes the, the screening process so long if you do it manually. Um, so yes, it doesn't need to be balanced. But, uh, but yes, uh, adding irrelevant module, uh, models, uh, records is very, very easy because it's just basically a random search and it is almost guaranteed that the, uh, the record that it gives you is going to be irrelevant. Thank you very much, Yapi, for that. I don't see any more urgent questions uh, now in the Q&A. Uh, the one in the chat are mainly compliments <laughs> for you. <laughs> so well done for that. And uh, maybe this is a time for you to, to briefly introduce Malala. Yes. Um, so Malala is, uh, is, I think, more of a computer scientist than I am. Um, she's working with uh, with Martin on uh, on trees, and uh, you guys all saw the the presentation that they've done in the last two lectures, uh, which is obviously covering the theory side of things. But for now, Malala is just going to introduce a Jupyter notebook example that you can use by yourselves to to understand the concept a bit more. Malala, I'm not even going to try and pronounce your surname, um, so, <laughs> so you can you can tell us where it is when when you get there. Thanks a lot, Malala. Thank you. Malala, Thank over you. to you. You're welcome to share the screen or whatever approach you, you would like to pursue. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, afternoon. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Jappi, for giving me the speech. And uh, I guess so I will share uh, to you a Jupyter notebook of finding the uh, most parsimonious tree and um, uh, where we ca you can play with when you want to like try to find the most parsimonious tree. Okay, let me share. Okay. Okay, so I will put on the chat the link to this uh, GitHub, which is uh, publicly available, so you can you can uh, download uh, all of the things there. Okay, so let me put it in the chat. Okay, 
Then um, you can find uh, a Python code here and the Jupyter notebook here. So let, let us see the Jupyter notebook. Okay. Yeah. So here we, we just import the Python code that we use for to find the most parsimonious tree. And the, um, if you want to generate uh, all, pos all possible label tree, then you can use the function uh, enumerate label trees. And uh, it fu it, uh, this function take as input uh, a list of, uh, of uh, integer numbers. So you, you named the, your uh, species as an integer number. Then um, uh, you got uh, the all possible tree. So the representation of the tree is here that each node uh, is represented by uh, a list uh, of length two. And uh, in the left is the left child of a node. And in the right is the right child of a node. So uh, for example, here we have a uh, a tree of two spaces and uh, and here the tree of uh, three spaces. So these are the tree of three spaces. We have a free tree here and uh, uh, here the tree of uh, four spaces. So we, we can see here that uh, the root has a left child, which is this one. And the, and the right child, which is this one, and the left child of a root is a node that has a left child one and a right child two. So that, that is the representation of a tree uh, in this code. And um, here we can see uh, the, the function that count the number of changes uh, using the Sankov algorithm. So you can use uh, Sankov, the function Sankov to, to count the number of tree, uh, number of changes for, uh, for a given uh, topology of tree and uh, a given uh, observed character at the leaf. So for example, here um, we have this uh, cost matrix so here our uh, cost of change is different for each uh, alphabet that we have. So our alphabet is presented here. And, um, and uh, the observed character at, at the leaf of our tree, of, of our topology of tree that is given here, is uh, uh, given here. So for example, here, uh, the the spaces one has a uh, C at at its leaf. So uh, the observed character at, of uh, species one is C, and the uh, species two is A. Species three is C. Species four uh, is A, and species five is G. So uh, when we use the the function Sankov and input the topology of tree and the alphabet that we use on our uh, 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 characters and uh, the observed character on the leaf and also the cost matrix, we can have that uh, output. So S is the score, the number of change and D is the vector cost at the, at the root so we can see here that the number of change for this uh, type of tree is six and uh, uh, the vector cost at the root is uh, given by this. So we can see that uh, the minimum in this list is six. So that is why uh, the parsimony score is six. And um, uh, this function uh, generate Javer uh, will generate 
uh, data set that you can use, uh, that you can play with. So um, uh, for this uh, generative, it, it takes as input uh, an initial genome. So you, you can, for example, use like uh, five A here and uh, a template of tree. So the uh, template of tree is uh, represented as a, uh, as a, no, uh, a list of, uh, so the node is represented as a list of, uh, of line three. Uh, so the first, uh, at the first list, you you put the node gen time, genetic time, and um, and uh, on the second input the uh, left child genetic time, and uh, at the third input uh, the right child genetic time. So, for ex example, we generate the root the root uh, from here uh, by using the genetic time uh, one. So. So when we got our root here, we use this to generate the nodes in the left by uh, by this uh, five uh, by the genetic time five, and uh, the node in the right by the genetic time uh, zero dot zero five. Then uh, we can do so on. So we have uh, here the leaf. Uh, and here also the leaf of this node, and uh, here the leaf of this node, and uh, here the leaf of this node. So when we generate the, the, the data, we can have uh, our simulated tree here. So here is a template of tree that we, we, we input on the, on, the, on the function. Then we can have this, uh, output uh, of um, a genome uh, that is uh, that we can use so um, so uh, to not be so confused uh, with this different representation we can use this uh, convert tree to convert this uh, type of tree to this to, to our representation of tree before so um, when we uh, try to convert uh, the tree that we got here, so we got the leaf of our tree. Uh, so this is a, a node, and uh, and uh, this is a node, and we can see here the left child and the right child of a node, and this is the other node, and the uh, and uh, we can see uh, here the left child and here the uh, right child. So, um, uh, and the extract genome tree uh, will uh, extract the, 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 the genome uh, that we have on the, on the tree. So, uh, for example, we want to extract uh, the genome at the leaf uh, from this uh, tree uh, generated here. So uh, we input this into the function extract genome. Then we, we got our data set that we, that we can use uh, when we want to uh, do the, when we want to find the most parsimonious tree. So uh, here we we use this uh, data set to to show you an example of uh, finding uh, the most parsimonious tree. And um, <clears throat> to find the most parsimonious tree, um, you can use the function uh, parsimonious sync, and um, you you put as input a list of trees. So the list of tree is a list of uh, uh, all, all of the tree generated by, by the uh, by for a given number of uh, species 
and uh, our data set. So our data set is a list of uh, genome of his uh, species and uh, the alphabet. So here, for example, our alphabet is a lower case. So uh, we, we put here our the alphabet for our uh, uh, genome data set and the, the co uh, cost matrix. So uh, for this uh, example, we, we assume that uh, because as we generate our uh, data set from using the true contour model, so each, um, each uh, base have the same, same cost of change, then uh, we use uh, this uh, cost matrix. So um, the output of is uh, uh, parsimonious sunk. So the, the parsimonious sunk is uh, uh, the list of uh, parsimonious tree and uh, the number of change for this uh, uh, tree. So for example, here we have a, uh, uh, number of change eight, and uh, the tree that gives this number of change eight is uh, given by this list here. Um, and we, we we have a multiple tree as output, but when we when we try to unroot this uh, different tree, uh, it it's only lead us to just one unrooted tree. Then uh, we can use uh, the, the function uh, canonical uh, to, to reduce uh, to, to, to reduce the, the representation of this tree to, to a single representation. So for example, here when we try to, to, to applicate the function canonical to the to the list of uh, tree that we got in this uh, result. So we can see here that uh, all of these tree uh, are, are the same when we, when we unrooted the tree. And, um, and uh, you can use uh, the canonical rooted list when you want to remove the duplicated a tree on a on a list of a tree. So, uh, for example, here we 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 want to remove all the duplicated uh, tree in this uh, list. So we have just uh, one uh, one output. So this this is the uh, unrooted tree uh, for this uh, uh, five uh, most parsimonious tree. Okay, so um, and uh, uh, if you want to like to replace uh, the the lapel of uh, of a tree, so instead of uh, just looking at one, two, three, you can put a name of uh, of a species here. Then you can uh, use the function replace uh, lapel in tree list and um, we end, we end with this uh, exercise so this exercise is just uh, an exercise that you can you can play with during the week then you can uh, ask a question if if there is something that you didn't understand so uh, we give here um a genome of um, of uh, primates and and their fans and um, and uh, we ask you to to try to find the most parsimonious tree using this uh, data set so uh we we, we see here that uh, the bovine uh, is uh, enumerated by one uh, moose by two, orang by three, and human by four, champ by five, and the gorilla by six, and the gibbon by seven. So first, you have to generate all all the possible tree for the, for these five species. So we have a list. Uh, we give the list 
of species here. And uh, our data set that we use here is this uh, primates and friends. And um, we, you can use the code to, to find the most uh, parsimonious tree uh, for this data set. So uh, I, I've put my uh, email address on the, at the top of this uh, Jupyter notebook. So if uh, you have a question, you can ask me when you, when you have. So, so I think that, that is all uh, I will present today. So thank you. Thank you very much, Malala. I think that was very useful, and I'm sure that, 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 that it was also a nice review of the lectures of, of, of Martin in the last couple of years. So thank you very much.